Hello and welcome to Gaze at the National Parks, the podcast. I'm Dusty. And I'm Mike. And welcome to our Season 3 Summit. In this episode, we're talking all about wildlife. If you're joining us for the first time, Summit episodes are how we cap off our seasons here at Gaze at the National Parks. It's a chance for us to look at all of the parks from the season together in one place. It's kind of like a big old family reunion. Those yeah. things. <laughs> mm-hmm. Have you had family reunions? Um, my dad's side of the family is pretty big so when we were growing up we would do like a big my grandma was like one of nine something like that so they would do like a giant family reunion so it was like all of the people my parents age who were their like cousins and second cousins then all of us kids who were like third cousins to one another or whatever it was like it was like a a hundred person plus event oh my goodness um and they we would have it at one person's house who had like a really big house that they were like the grandparent matriarch of the family. There was like costume parades. Was there kickball? There was no kickball. Oh, well, then I guess it yeah. wasn't a family reunion no. then. Mm-mm. There was, was crying. Fam- <laughs> so then it and there was drama. Was. <laughs> yeah. I feel like. What about you? I only remember one proper family reunion mm-hmm. my entire life. Uh, but I do feel like basically. Anytime there's a barbecue, it's basically a family reunion. I feel like family reunions are from a time when families were very big and, you know, and also spread out. And I'm not saying that they don't happen today because families are spread out. But um, I feel like (gasps) families of nine don't happen as often. You know what I'm looking forward to? What? Chosen family reunions. Oh, there you go. Oh, Oh, I'm here for that. Mm. Let's... Let's make that like a term people use all the time. The chosen family reunion. Chosen family reunion. Yeah. I mean, but isn't that just you and me hanging out on a Friday night? (laughs) (laughs) It is. Yeah. It is. Add a pepper and a few more and we're good. (laughs) Right. (laughs) Right. In season three, we visited Mesa Verde and Great Sand Dunes National Park, both in Colorado, Joshua Tree National Park in California, Petrified Forest and Grand Canyon National Parks, both in Arizona. Acadia National Park in Maine, Catoctin Mountain in Maryland, and Gettysburg National Military Park in Pennsylvania. Each of these summit episodes examines the parks of the past season through its own particular lens. This often includes visitorship, histories, hiking trails, and today's summit, which is all about wildlife. Now, we haven't approached these summits this year, and uh, they are heavy on the trivia. So, Mike, are you ready? Yes. Great. Okay. So, we're going to talk all about the parks that we visited this year and this season, and talk all about the wildlife that are found in those parks. Great. And they are in no particular order. It's like Nat Geo over here. Exactly. Also, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the stage, Nat Geo. Right. How have we not put her on the list? I know. Nat Geo. Nat Geo. Natalie Geo. Natalie Geo. <laughs> Natalie Geo. We might have to bring her to life later. I think so. Okay, great. All right. So before we start, uh, we want to give a quick shout out to authors Emily Hoff and Megan Keller uh, for their book, Scenic Science of the National Parks and Explorer's Guide to Wildlife, Geology, and Botany. So you got me this book. I did. It uh, was a Christmas gift. It was a holiday gift. Mm-hmm. That's right. And it was wonderful. Because I nerd out over things like, what is that plant? And what is that bird? And like, I nerd real hard. Mm -hmm. And so this is an entire book that is beautifully illustrated and very well laid out, so well written. And it breaks up the parks into regions of the country and it breaks it up by parks. So you can read all about all the different indigenous species and all the different animals that you can see Mm -hmm. In all the different parts. And it's beautifully illustrated. It is amazing. Mm -hmm. So good. So easy to read. So beautifully like laid out. Mm -hmm. So easy on the eyes. Like some people. Like some people. All right. Are we ready? Yeah. Okay. So here's your first question. Great. This is the only national park from season three where one might see what's called a greater roadrunner. What is Petrified Forest? That is correct. Wonderful. I was like, oh, it's not that far from Grand Canyon, though. So I'm wondering if that would also be there. I was almost going to say Joshua Tree, but I'm glad I stuck to my initial instinct. Petrified Forest National Park, located in Arizona, is the only national park that contains historic Route 66. We talk all about this in episode 51 and in our trail mix this season on scenic byways. Other animals you might see here at Petrified Forest and Painted Desert, because they are next door to one another, 
is the pronghorn, sort of like an American goat antelope, and also the collared lizard. Okay, so we didn't see any pronghorn while we were out and about. No. But we may have come across the collared lizard. Oh, okay. Okay, so let's talk about this collared lizard for a second. Petrified forest, as uh, if you listen to our episode, you'll find out more about how like... It's the national park to go to if you want to see things that were around when Pangea was a thing. Mm -hmm. You know, all those years ago. Yeah. When we were first born onto this earth. Exactly. Because we're witches. Witches. So that is enough to blow my mind Mm -hmm. just right there. That like these things were here during Pangea. Mm -hmm. Like what? Okay. But here's something else that blows my mind. Okay. So this tiny little collared lizard, right? Definitely eats insects. Definitely eats smaller lizards. I know. But it does. Silence of the lizards. Um, We know that reptiles lived at the same time as dinosaurs, Mm -hmm. right? Every single collared lizard that you see in Petrified Forest National Park right now. Is a dinosaur? Not a dinosaur. Mm. Is a descendant of the collared lizards that lived at the same time of the dinosaurs. And they look exactly the same now as they did then. But how do they know that? Just from the fossil record? Yeah, exactly. Mm. All that stuff. Science. Dino DNA. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Okay, here, I have another question for you. Petrified wood looks like a rainbow of colors. Also, I don't understand why the queer outdoors hasn't adopted petrified wood as its symbol. Perhaps the gay can we do it of the queer outdoors <laughs> can we do this sure. can we make this a trend mm-hmm. like obviously do not take petrified wood but like yeah. why do we not have a piece of petrified wood as our like hello yeah, right the rainbow. Our symbol mm-hmm. okay so some of them <laughs> cuz we're old and tired <laughs> and we've been around since pangea exactly exactly okay some of the minerals in petrified wood include chromium that appears bright green manganese dioxide that appears purple and black geothite that appears yellow, brown, and orange, hematite that appears red and pink, silicone dioxide that appears white and clear, and finally, this mineral that appears black in petrified wood, but if you saw it in a gemstone store, it appears another color, and it might cause you to easily mistake it for a very, very expensive precious metal. It's also known for protection from negative energy and boosting the brain. It's, well, you said hematite, which is what I... I have a ring. It's a hematite ring, which is what it's I would have thought. not hematite. No. That clue would be easily mistaken. It's black. Black. So we've but got... But in the gemstone store, not black. No. That's interesting. So. You might feel dumb for thinking that it's this other precious, mm. luminous... Mm. Oh, is it pyrite? There we go. Which is also known as... Fool's gold. There you go. Fool's gold. <laughs> Fool's gold. <laughs> okay, yes. So pyrite or fool's gold is created in... Pe- <laughs> fool's gold. <laughs> <laughs> it's created in petrified wood when sulfur found in decaying organic matter interacts with iron. It's also good for creativity, y'all. Great. It's a great stone. It's a great crystal to carry around if you're a creative or to put on a desk space. Welcome to the stage. Carry creative. around. Carry around. Great. It's time for the next park. Are you ready? I am. This is the only park that we visited this season where you might be able to spot a pronghorn, a circus beetle, and the western tanager, which is a bird that is yellow, black, and sometimes orange and red. And it would be all of these animals all in the same spot. What is Grand Canyon? Ooh, Great is it guess. Joshua Tree? It is Great Sand Dunes oh, National Park. Oh, womp, 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 womp. Right. Okay, great. I have... Now we're going right into another question. Are you ready? I am. The prairie variety of this flower can be found growing in the Great Sand Dunes. And other than its shape and color, it gets its name from the fact that it faces and tracks its light source throughout the day, even when the light source moves. What is a sunflower? That's correct. There we go. The prairie sunflower can be seen in the Great Sand Dunes. It is the only type of sunflower that makes its home in the sand. Hmm. The photos of it literally like growing out of the sand. Yeah. Like they'll grow all over the dunes. Um, sunflowers originated in the land, also known as North America, and uh, particularly are seen in Colorado. And you can literally see both common sunflowers mm-hmm. and large prairie sunflowers. Cool. And because of the way they germinate, they basically always will bloom. Because, like, some of their seeds seeds lay dormant. Some of them will grow immediately in the next season. Well, I mean, like, sunflowers, if you ever grow sunflowers at home, common sunflowers, 
you can basically take the whole sunflower and just like put it somewhere in the dirt and like later the next season it'll sort of germinate itself like all of this the the center of the sunflower is seeds like, oh yeah, yeah all of it is seeds so it's yeah. amazing yeah yeah the science of nature right you can hear all about the great sand dunes in episode 48 called the dune field it is time for our next park you ready yep so the cuddly name for this type of cactus is derived from a nickname for this person, the 26th president of the United States, and is found only in this national park. Well, he's Teddy Roosevelt, and what is the Joshua Tree That national is correct. Park? So it's called the Teddy Bear Chola cactus. Mm-hmm. Or the Teddy Bear Chola. Yeah, Teddy Bear Chola. Tree. <laughs> While Joshua Trees, the park's namesake, can only really be found in this spot in the Mojave Desert, do listen to episode 49 about the 49 Palms Oasis hike. Look at what we did there. And episode 50 about the Hidden Valley Trail and the Chola Cactus Garden, where we talk all about Joshua Trees and how they grow. And also, the teddy bear chola can be seen abundantly in Joshua Tree National Park. One can see them very up close at the Chola Cactus Garden. They get this common name from their shape, looking like the arms of a teddy bear. Mm -hmm. They're cute and cuddly, but don't touch them. Ooh. Each one of their spines is covered in so many microscopic barbs that allows them to stick to anything, including human skin. Hooray! Very painful and difficult to remove them. So maybe do what I did on the Chola Cactus Garden walk, which is just walk very, very slowly Mm -hmm. and keep both feet on the ground at all times. Yes. No levitating. Well, it's hard to do that when you are who we are. Also, let's mention the kangaroo rat, which can be found in Joshua Tree. They are nocturnal, so you may never see one, but they look like little mice with long tails. Here's something. These little kangaroo rats do not need to drink water. Yep. They collect seeds in their cheeks and they take them to their burrows and those seeds collect moisture when they're down below. So when they eat the seeds, that's all the water that they need. Okay, let's move on to the next park. Great. Yeah. This is the only national park from season three where you might see a broad tailed hummingbird. What is Mesa Verde? That is correct. Mm -hmm. Good job. Yeah. Okay. So speaking of birds in Mesa Verde. Mm hmm. Another one you might spot while you're there is the red-tailed hawk. So these are birds of prey, and they're throughout the park. This is something that this wonderful book told me, which was, it has such like a sinister and terrifying sound that it makes. Mm -hmm. Like it's, you know, like hawk cry. Mm -hmm. That's the sound that's often used in movies when they have to like have like a villainous sounding bird like squawk that makes sense so often sound designers will use the red-tailed hawk plants that are often seen in mesa verde are douglas fir big sagebrush and the showy daisy okay so are you ready for the next park yeah this was the only park this season where we saw a bear what is catoctin mountain that is correct Mm -hmm. it was we saw plenty of bears though when we were on Kauai. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> well that one hike mm-hmm. other animals that you might see in Catoctin Mountain include white-tailed deer bobcats moles and fishers which are like weasels that climb trees really fast not oh. to be confused with fishers mm-hmm. fishers and for the birders there are almost 70 different types of birds that can be found in Catoctin Mountain including the red-bellied woodpecker which along with 13 other types of birds found in the park are either being monitored for their vulnerability to climate change and survival or the majority of their species global population is found here in this area. And while we're in Catoctin Mountain, Gettysburg National Military Park is very close. And if you are there this summer, it will be a great spot to see the group of cicadas called Brood X emerge. Wow. So if that is something that calls to you, then you could watch the cicadas emerge from the ground while exploring Gettysburg National Military Park. Exciting. I don't know that I I want to make an event out of watching the cicadas emerge, but I'm sure there are people who love that. Mm-hmm. And for that, great. Yeah. Get on it, girl. Yeah. All right, are you ready for the next park? I am. This is the only park from season three where one might be able to find barnacles. What is Acadia National Park? That's correct. Okay, I have a question. Did Mm -hmm. we see any foxes while we were in Acadia? I can't remember or not. I can't remember if we Mm. did or if I have just watched Fleabag a lot. I think you probably just watched Fleabag a lot. I don't think we saw any foxes. I saw 
I saw a fox in Cape Cod in mm-hmm. Provincetown, but that's Beach the only foxes. place I've ever seen foxes. Yeah. Well, we also saw those foxes in um, Channel Islands. Oh, yeah. Different kind of fox. Different kind though. of fox. So one can certainly see foxes in Acadia. Yeah. You can also see rabbits, squirrels, beavers, otters, bobcats, mink, and raccoons. There are also many marine animals you might catch, like seal or a harbor porpoise. Also, it is possible to do some whale watching in Acadia, though it is rare that you would see a whale near the harbor, but you can take a boat tour a little further out. Something that I love about Acadia that we haven't seen ourselves, but can be seen there, are sea snails. Oh. Periwinkle and tortoiseshell limpet sea snails can be found abundantly throughout Acadia in the tide pools during high tide. Mm-hmm. And they are found all around. They are so abundant because since it's a national park, hunting is not allowed. Ah. So no one is technically allowed to take the sea snails for food. Okay. But it's worth waiting for high tide to see if you can see any. Yeah, definitely. Also, tidal pools are so fascinating. Yeah. Agreed. Final park. Great. (laughs) This is the only park from season two where one may be able to see a California condor. What is Grand Canyon? That is correct. Okay, could you imagine if we saw a California condor? Their wingspan is crazy, isn't it's it? It's unreal. Yeah. Um, I would have collapsed. Yeah. <laughs> you know, if it was a movie, they would have used the red build, the red tailed hawk <laughs> noise, even though it's incorrect. That is true. They totally would yes. have done that. Grand Canyon is a great spot to see ponderosa pines, which have a strong smell and an orange colored bark. A few things to note about ponderosa pines. If you see one with a giant scar, like a shape across its trunk, it may have been struck by lightning because lightning strikes in the Grand Canyon around 25,000 times a year. And if you see one that's been cut down, you can find out how old the tree was when it was cut down by counting the rings and dividing by two because because they produce two rings a year and the color of the rings look very similar after the tree is dead. There are a number of animals one might see in the Grand Canyon. One might see elk that are found in the canyon. We saw elk in Rocky Mountain Mm -hmm. National Park. And it is technically possible to get close to elk because they don't necessarily move when people come near them. But that is not a reason to get near elk. No. Like all wildlife, stay away, give them space, never feed them. Also, elk can be very dangerous. Yeah, they're big. They're huge. Yeah. Okay, another thing you can see all the time in Grand Canyon, and we might have seen them, I'm sure they were flying overhead, are ravens. Oh. Never more. Never more. I know. They will swoop down and take food, even that if it's in a bag. Right. So it's another great reason. Never leave your food out. No. I've also had a traumatic experience with the bird stealing food out of my hand. Did you? Yeah. When I was a kid in Disney World, I had a churro and a seagull like scrape the top of my head and stole the churro out of my oh, hand. Oh, that's why you never buy churros anymore. That's right. Why I don't have hair. <laughs> <laughs> it was the curse of the gull. <laughs> The most frequent interaction with an animal at Grand Canyon is usually the rock squirrel. Mm -hmm. And um, they look adorable. Mm -hmm. And they will absolutely want your food. Of course they will. But they are scavengers when it comes to uh, trying to take food. Mm -hmm. So don't give them human food. Just like those cute little baby chipmunks on the top of Angel's Landing. I know. They were everywhere. They were. They were cute, but They they were everywhere. They were like hunting for food too. Like you, like, whoa. Right. The sources for today's summit include the National Park Service and the book Scenic Science of the National Parks, an explorer's guide to wildlife, geology, and botany by Emily Hoff and Megan Keller. Let's end this summit with some drag corner. Great. Okay, so um, one had been chosen. So we had picked one, but... but one emerged. One emerged, mm-hmm. and I think we need to do the emergent queen. Emergent queen. That's right. So... <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, them, please welcome to the stage. Nat Geo. Okay. Natalie Geo. Natalie Geo. Mm-hmm. Natalie Geo is an Italian. She's queen. Italian. <laughs> How could she not say. be? She's, She's Italian. And she loves the family reunions. We're tying she it all together. She loves family folks. reunions. She's Natalie very Gio. Italian. Right. Natalie Geo. Mm-hmm. Do you think do you think Geo is and short? And she drives a Geo. Giovanni <laughs> or something like that? I mean, is the last name? Ken Giovanni. Well, Giovanni is usually a first, first name. name. Yeah, I think Giovanni. Unless like her, there's a last name, and mm. it's like her middle name is Giovanni. Oh, maybe she's not Geode. Oh, I don't like that as much. Oh, okay. <laughs> I thought that was clever. It is clever. Mm-hmm. Okay, so who's Natalie Geo? <laughs> 
who is net well she's an italian queen she loves her family reunions um she i feel like is a fossil queen she's oh. like an italian she's like you know what i'm gonna go out and hunt for fossils in the field and then i'm gonna put cook, cook you some um okay pasta vajol <laughs> go with me here go okay. with me here I feel like Nat Geo has a cooking show, Mm -hmm. right? Where she cooks Italian dishes, Mm -hmm. but she baits you with Italian dishes, but really like uh, she serves you science and Mm -hmm. geology, Mm -hmm. right? So it's like, all right, everyone, today we're making uh, pasta primavera. Everybody look at here. Oh, and look inside of this bowl. Look what I found. It's a rare fossil tooth Mm -hmm. from a, a triceratops mm-hmm. and she talks all about what that is mm-hmm. so it's like you're learning how to cook and also learning about mm-hmm. geology you're gonna leave that on the stove for about 30 minutes or like this fossil 30 million years or like this right. fossil 30 million years right <laughs> yeah i feel like that sounds oh sounds my god right. i love it i want to so, learn mm-hmm. i want i would oh i want to yeah. produce the show she would have her merch would be an apron that said i'd bone the cook <laughs> <laughs> so, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Nat Geo. This has been the Season 3 Summit by Gaze at the National Parks, the podcast. And we're here to remind you to hike early and hike often, and that adventure is always out there. Gaze at the National Parks was created and is hosted by us, Dustin Ballard and Michael Ryan. To see images from this episode, follow our Instagram at Gaze at the National Parks. To contact us, email us at gaze at the National Parks at gmail.com. And to find out more about the parks visited on this show, visit our website, gazeatthenationalparks.com. That's gaze, G-A-Z-E. All original artwork featured on Instagram and on our website is by me, Michael Ryan. All original music was written by Dave Seaman and performed by Dave Seaman, Mariella Klinger, and Sean Sklios. Our music producer is Skylar Fortgang. This episode was edited by me, Dustin Ballard. We would also like to acknowledge that while recording this episode, that we were on the traditional and stolen lands of the Lenape people, also known as Middlesex County, New Jersey.